This session is going to be moderated by Susanna Sokoto. Susanna Sokoto is a professional lecturer in residence at the Washington College of Law, the American University. She's also the director of War Crimes Research Office and director of the Washington College Law Summer Law Program in The Hague. She has a long, long resume. I draw that to your attention, but know that she also clerked for the Office of the Prosecutor at the International Criminal Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia and worked with the Center for Human Rights Legal Action in Guatemala. And to moderate this next special session, I'd like to call up Susanna. Susanna? Good afternoon. I want to uh, first thank um, David Crane and uh, the Jackson Center, the American Society of International Law, and the other sponsors of the conference, uh, and of course the Chautauqua Institution, uh, for inviting me to participate and for holding such a fascinating series of discussions. Um, it's, a, it's truly an honor to be here and to hopefully continue uh, what has been a, a very interesting uh, series of discussions this morning. Over the next hour or so, we'll have the distinct privilege of hearing directly again from the prosecutors who were with us about their approach to and the challenges they face in the prosecution and the investigation and prosecution of uh, gender crimes at the international level. I think it, it may be important that before we get started on what I hope will be a fruitful discussion about the challenges involved in prosecuting these crimes, that we take a moment to recognize some of the incredible advances that have been made in this area of the law over the last 15 years or so. Prior to the mid-1990s, uh, crimes committed exclusively or disproportionately against women and girls in times of conflict or in times of repression were largely either ignored or at most treated as secondary to uh, other crimes. But overwhelming evidence uh, and reporting of the systematic raping of women in conflicts uh, over the last 15, 20 years has helped to really create unprecedented levels of awareness of rape and sexual violence um, and uh, has, as a result, been instrumental in some of the great strides that have been made in the investigation and prosecution of sexual violence, in particular um, at the ad hoc tribunals for the former Yugoslavia and Rwanda. In a departure from the statutes governing the international military tribunals established in the wake of World War II that we heard about yesterday and today, the statutes of the ICTY and ICTR expressly include the crime against humanity of rape. And moreover, in practice, uh, these tribunals have recognized that sexual violence may constitute a number of additional crimes, including the war, crime, uh, the war crimes of torture and outrages upon personal dignity, the crimes against uh, humanity, not only rape, but enslavement and persecution, and sexual violence as an act of genocide. Uh, additional strides were made in the drafting of the Rome Statute, establishing the International Criminal Court, which incorporates many of the advances developed through the jurisprudence of the ICTY and the ICTR. So, for example, the Rome Statute includes specific gender-based crimes, including rape, sexual slavery, enforced prostitution, forced pregnancy, and enforced sterilization under both the war crimes and crimes against humanity provisions. In addition, the court's document laying out the elements of crimes recognizes that although rape is not listed as a form of genocide under the Rome Statute, genocide committed by acts causing serious bodily or mental harm may include acts of torture, rape, sexual violence, or inhuman or degrading treatment. More significantly, and I think we'll hear more about this uh, from uh, Fatou Ben Souda, the deputy prosecutor of the ICC, the history of the ICC uh, thus far with respect to the investigation of gender crimes is encouraging. Right? Two of the four persons pursued so far in the Congo, situ the DRC situation, have been charged with sexual slavery and rape, both as a war crime and a crime against humanity. Rape allegations have been brought forward against three of the four individuals pursued by the court in the Darfur situation, including the sitting head of state, Al Bashir. Uh, rape and sexual enslavement allegations have been included in the arrest warrants against uh, Joseph Kony and Vincent Adi in the Uganda situation. And finally, rape as a war crime and a crime against humanity uh, charges have been levied against uh, uh, the only suspect identified so far in the Central African Republic situation, Jean-Pierre Bemba. The statute of the Special Court for Sierra Leone also recognizes a range of sexual violence-based war crimes and crimes against humanity, including rape, sexual slavery, enforced prostitution, and forced pregnancy. 
Uh, and as we heard earlier today, the special court has held that a, quote, forced marriage in the context in which it occurred in Sierra Leone constitutes the crime against humanity of an other inhumane act under its statute. Now, nevertheless, great progress, great strides, but significant challenges in the investigation and prosecution of the, these crimes remain. Today, we have a remarkable opportunity to have a discussion with the prosecutors who are with us, who are on the front lines doing this work on the ground about these challenges and about what it takes to bring to life the great advances that we have seen over the last 10 or 15 years. So before we begin, I want to thank each of you again uh, for agreeing to participate in this very important dialogue. Uh, since all of the prosecutors were eloquently introduced by Leila Sadat this morning, I won't repeat that, but I will say a word about how we will proceed with the session. Uh, I will be presenting a series of questions about the investigation and prosecution of gender crimes and then give each of the prosecutors an opportunity to respond and share their insights with us. Uh, we'll then hopefully have a few minutes uh, toward the end to open up the discussion and invite questions from the audience. So let's uh, get started. Um, first question is about evidence. As we heard about this morning, gender-based crimes often present particular challenges in terms of getting victims to come forward. Many women and men who survived uh, gender-based violence do not want to report these crimes for a variety of reasons. Because of the stigma attached to crimes of sexual violence in many cultures, some victims feel terrified they will be shunned by society, by their own society, if they were to report what happened to them. Some women victims of rape fear that they, mean, they themselves may be subject to criminal charges because a reference to adultery in the definition of rape in some countries' criminal code exposes them to the risk of prosecution for the crime of adultery if they were to come forward. Some victims fear that their attackers may still be at large and the risk of, uh, and could retaliate against them for, or their families if they come forward. On the other hand, uh, recognizing the difficulty in prosecuting these crimes, Human rights groups and others have been critical of instances when the prosecutors have failed to include charges of gender-based violence in their case against the accused. So, for instance, in the case against Lubanga that we were talking about earlier, the first person arrested uh, and tried by the ICC, human rights groups criticized the prosecutor for failing to include sexual violence charges against Lubanga, despite allegations that girls had been kidnapped into Lubanga's militia and often raped and or kept as sex slaves. So the question is, how certain as a prosecutor do you need to feel about the evidence before bringing charges of gender-based crimes? Are there or do different considerations arise for you in these kinds of cases than others where gender-based violence is not an issue? And I'll turn, just go down the line, turn to David maybe for initial comments. That's an excellent question and uh, it's a great question to lead off our discussion uh, this afternoon. Uh, of course, when I arrived in Sierra Leone with three suitcases and uh, a good friend named Mike Pan and my chief investigation, Zal White, uh, we knew already that the cornerstone of our indictments uh, against those individuals who bore the greatest responsibility in Sierra Leone uh, were gender crimes. And I was bound and determined to, to do that. And along with a wonderful team from around the world, uh, we began to sort all of that out and begin to uh, look at the various crimes perpetrated against women and, of course, certainly children, which uh, really cried out uh, to you when you began to look at the evidence. And certainly I hope that uh, Joseph uh, uh, this afternoon, as well as Leslie Taylor, uh, will be able to discuss that with you uh, informally as well uh, after this panel. But the cornerstone of uh, when we began drafting the indictments and beginning our investigations uh, was, uh, was gender crimes. I won't go through that because most of the, most of the uh, crimes listed in the statute uh, were uh, the ones that you would expect, rape, sexual slavery, terrorism, intimidation, and all of those. But as we were going through, about 13 months into the process, we'd already indicted uh, all 13 of the individuals we felt bore the greatest responsibility. Uh, I remember bringing my senior staff together and we were kind of trying to puzzle out what do we do with the bushwives, uh, the tens of thousands of women who were driven into the bush and basically treated like cattle, traded, branded, uh, uh, forced to reproduce, carry ammunition, wash, what have you, and many of them stayed in the bush for, for many, many years. 
Uh, and we began to try to figure out, we couldn't figure out where to put that crime because it was a gravamen uh, of the offense against the women of Sierra Leone. Uh, and I, I recall we were just chatting about it and, and a, a, young, a wonderful young Ghanaian barrister named Wadua Waiafa said, why don't we call it forced marriage? And there's this pause. Someone said, in times of armed conflict. You could just see, you know, even my wheels were churning. The smoke was coming out of my ears, uh, I'm told. And, uh, and it was a really kind of a, a moment of revelation. And then, of course, we tossed it back. Well, there's lots of forced marriage uh, around the world. Women are forced to marry. And I said, no, 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 this is, this is different. This is different. This is uh, armed conflict-based. Uh, and so we tossed that around. Uh, and long story short, uh, we amended the indictments against the Revolutionary United Front and the uh, Armed Forces Revolutionary Council uh, and hooked it under the statute which said under many statutes you see crimes against humanity and it lists all of those and then there's in our particular statute, Joseph, if I recall, it was paragraph J that said and other inhumane acts and everybody looked at each other and said well, that's an, un that's an other inhumane act. And so we actually use the statute uh, as a force of law versus just a, a jurisdictional, subject matter jurisdictional element. And we amended the indictments and kind of held our breath because this is a first ever. And I uh, remember when we filed the motion to amend and we were thinking, oh my gosh. Uh, and uh, sure enough, the, uh, the, the motions were granted. And of course, you still have to prove it. And so, uh, uh, Throughout the trial process, we, uh, we stood up, and we had some challenges, particularly uh, uh, with uh, some of the judges, uh, but that's another story, and, uh, but we, we prevailed. And I think that that's something that, uh, that we, uh, we all are collectively very proud of, because again, uh, I would just say that crimes against women are more than just what you think that they would be that we've always been used to, and that I would say that we need to always be looking culturally and practically as to what took place in a particular uh, region of the world and we may find out that the, uh, the crimes that the international community has fashioned together is not really the crime that actually took place. And so forced marriage in times of armed conflict and I would, I would uh, actually uh, highlight Professor Michael Sharf's excellent law review article within six months, which is usually what Michael does, saying that this is really a, uh, something that should be studied and thought about. And it's really, a, I think, a very excellent compilation of uh, why we thought, he said it a lot better than I, did, I could ever say, uh, or any of my team. But it just, it, it really kind of, in four corners, captures the idea of forced marriage in times of armed conflict. So I'll just leave the initial comments to that. Um, I, I think um, it needs to be said that as a result of the work that has been done by the ad hoc tribunals, the tribunals that were established before the International Criminal Court, there is particular focus that has been made in the Rome Statute to gender crimes uh, and, and sexual violence. And um, if you look, for example, at Article 54 of the Rome Statute, it, it says that um, the prosecutor in investigating, to, in doing an effective investigation and prosecution, has to take into account the nature of the crime in particular, and it draws particular reference to this, where it involves sexual violence, gender violence, or violence against children. And this obligation is not only placed on the prosecutor alone, because if you look also at Article 68 of the Rome Statute, it talks about the court itself um, shall have regard to all the relevant factors, including gender and the nature of the crime, in particular, where the crime involves sexual or gender violence or violence against children. And I, I think this is largely as a result of the precedents that we have so far, and in this case, making particular reference to cases like the Akayasu uh, judgment that has been referred to this morning by my colleague um, of the ICTR. And in the office of the prosecutor, we also pay particular attention to this. Um, and if you look at our prosecutorial strategy, we talk about uh, this attention being given 
to the crimes that are committed against women and the crimes that are committed against uh, children, the sexual and gender crimes. There is the Article 42.9, which places a specific requirement on the prosecutor to appoint advisors with expertise on specific gender and sexual violence. So we, we have tried in the OTP to have experts and focal points that will assist the teams to deal with this and give specific training to um, investigators before they are deployed to the field or before they are conducting this type of interviews uh, with, with, with the victims of gender and sexual crimes. We've also set up the children, gender and children unit, which is composed also of legal advisors and psychosocial uh, experts who will advise the investigators and they themselves uh, do take part sometimes in these interviews to ensure that we um, do not re-traumatize the, the victims, we do not re-traumatize those who have suffered the uh, crimes committed against them. And just last year, in November, uh, the prosecutor has appointed uh, Professor Catherine McKinnon as special advisor <laughs> on, on gender issues, um, and not only ex um, assisting the prosecutor, but myself, as the focal point for gender issues within the office of the, of the prosecutor, as well as the gender and children's unit. Um, coming to your specific question about how certain we need to be uh, before we charge for um, uh, these kind of crimes. In the Lubanga case, which is the first trial of the um, ICC, we have been, <coughs> as you have said, we have been criticized for being, for charging, um, uh, for, for bringing very focused charges on child conscription, conscripting and enlisting children, child soldiers, and not charging for gender crimes, even though we had um, uh, evidence, according to um, those who criticize. Yes, we have investigated, I, I have to admit. We have investigated because, as I said, the Office of the Prosecutor lays uh, particular importance on, on this, not only because it's a statutory obligation, because, but because I think it is the right thing to, to do. Um, gender crimes have been neglected for too long. Um, our investigations, at the time that we were in a position to bring charges against Lubanga, who at the time was going to be released uh, by the Democratic Republic of Congo authorities, we had very good evidence. We were certain of the evidence that he was uh, enlisting and conscripting children and using them to actively participate in hostilities. We also had evidence that children were being used as uh, sex, sex slaves. We know that there was sexual violence that were committed against these children because we investigated them. What we lacked at that particular moment was how to link those crimes that were being committed at the, at the, at the lower level, how do we link it to Lubanga? And we did not have that evidence at that particular time. And we thought that um, it was crucial also to give importance to the crime of conscripting children into the armies and using them to fight wars and battles that they do not know anything about. They are completely innocent of, and it was time that we also raised the awareness, at least for the international community, to know that this is a serious crime that is being committed, but no particular attention was given to it. A whole generation is affected by this crime, but it was taken as just normal. And for the first time, based on these sole charges, um, international prosecution at that level, we decided to bring the case against Lubanga. This has not, of course, stopped us from, during the trial, to bring out the life of a child soldier when they are abducted, especially the girls. If you have been following the Lubanga trial, you will find that girls were abducted, they were used as slaves, they were used as wives in the camps, and the evidence was clear because we got the girls themselves to come forward and to give this evidence. This has also not stopped us from the second case, the DRC2 case, to charge the, the two perpetrators of these crimes, of sexual and, and, and gender crimes. But what I always say is, um, it is it is important to be quite certain of your evidence before you go to trial, to be able to present it and ensure that you get a conviction. 
I think the worst thing that can happen is to bring these charges and have the perpetrators of these crimes not convicted and released by the court. I think this will be double traumatization for the victims. Thank you. Yes, um, like Professor Crane said, at the special court we had uh, unique challenges. Unique in the sense that uh, the special court is one of the ad hoc tribunals where it was created and operated in the country of the conflict. So there is a high sensitivity level because of that. It's not like in Arusha, you know, the incident occurred in Rwanda and then the court is elsewhere, or in the ICTY, the incident occurred somewhere and then the court is elsewhere. In the case of Sierra Leone, the court is where the conflict took place. And when you're talking of investigating rape cases, for example, it is a total different ballgame. And um, <clears throat> from a practical point of view is that there comes accompanying gender violence, cultural sensitivities, deep cultural sensitivities. And um, <clears throat> from my experience over the last 20 years in terms of prosecution is that there's something which a lot of people don't know. Men don't mind being prosecuted for murder, but they really do mind being prosecuted for rape. They really do. That is an aspect most people don't know. And even in the case of the CDF and the RUF, the defense fought bitterly with those charges that are gender related, far more than they fought for modern physical violence, the amputations. When it came into amending the indictment, for example, like I mentioned this morning on the CDF case, in terms of introducing gender violence um, charges, it was a huge fight. And also, talking about the cultural sensitivity aspect, in that case where we charged Chief Inga Norman, he was a well-respected individual in society. Law betied him to be charged with an offense such as rape. So it was a huge fight. So, and this cultural sensitivity is, um, makes us, the prosecutors, very wary how we approach these issues. And um, <clears throat> don't forget, in operating in the country where the conflict was, gives us this extra challenge of witnesses. Will people want to come forward and give evidence against these persons? With whatever form of protections that they may be have, probably like screen or orders, but they're not protected against the accused persons. The accused person sees them, listens to them, and of course it is their right. In one of the cases in court, we have Chief Inga Norman when he was cross-examined for himself, told one of the witnesses, I know you and you know me. Those were enough words. I know you and you know me. So when it comes to uh, prosecuting and even the course of investigating these rape offenses or other offenses relating to sexual violence, the heightened challenges are there. And coming to the practical and technical aspect of it all is that, for example, in one of our indictments, we charged for sexual slavery and other inhumane acts. Sexual slavery as a crime against humanity and other inhumane act for forced marriage in one count. The judges, and I think I agree with them, that is on hindsight, say you cannot do that. That is duplicitous. And so as we are learning now in the learning process, is that when you put those two together, the judges decided that sexual slavery is different from forced marriage and that you cannot charge the two in one count. So cleverly enough, they let go the sexual slavery, which we have in another account, and then dealt with the issue of forced marriage as other inhumane act. And like um, earlier on said, I think David mentioned it, that when we looked at the situation and we looked at the facts on the ground, we agreed that forced marriage, we could take a chance with it, and that the evidence is there. And as all lawyers will agree, and like it is said in Latin, ibi use, ibi remedium where there's an infraction of law, there has to be a remedy. Now the evidence has presented itself. There has been an infraction of law. There has been a violation of women's rights. What do we do about that? Do we sit quiet and say, no, the law does not provide for it? 
we looked at the law and then we saw that under Article G, yes, other inhumane act, which is the residual wing of crimes against humanity, war crimes, the residual angle, we could go under that. We succeeded in the case of the AFRC. The court and the appellate chamber agreed with us. But as you know, with all lawyers ex excited as we were, we pressed further. We brought it now under crimes against humanity, forced marriage, and we've succeeded at the trial level in the case of the RUF. On Thursday, we're going to argue that on appeal as to whether forced marriage is constituent of crimes against humanity. And um, coming now to the, the uh, sensitivity of these issues, it comes also with the mentality of the warring factions. There was a slogan in the conflict in Sierra Leone, and what was it? Women are rations of war. Women are rations of war. When the warring factions will invade a town or a village, they'll capture the civilians and they'll divide them into two lines. Women and children on one line and then the men on the other. If they decide to kill the men, they'll just kill the men or they can conscript them or enlist them. But with the women and then they distribute them and share them. Starting off with the commanders, the commanders will have the first choice. They will choose the most beautiful or the youngest. And at the end of the day, each and every one will have his own allocation of the women. That is what was meant by women and the rations of war. And now, looking at the elements of proof in prosecution, the perpetrator has to know. The perpetrator has to know about the facts surrounding the issue of this first marriage and the reference of Bush wives. So how are we to prove that these commanders or these foot soldiers, having been assigned to a woman, this is your wife, takes the woman as his wife, protects the woman, and there's an exclusive relationship, an exclusive conjugal relationship. Children, everything that happens in a marriage occurs in this relationship. And now we are to prove that that perpetrator knew that those circumstances were legal. So there was a challenge in that as well, but we were able to go through that by supporting evidence, especially from the victims themselves. When they come forward to say that I was assigned to him, I refused, and he comes in at night, compels me with the use of photo threat to sleep with him, and there is an issue from this relationship, and I continue to perform daily chores for him. They do the laundry, they do the cooking. This is what is called bushwives. So we have to prove that, and that is the difficulty sometimes in prosecutions. So like I said, there are so many of them, but um, with the experience we've been able to maneuver through them, and uh, we've been successful with the two trials that are complete, that is the CDF trial and the FRC trial. And uh, come Wednesday and Thursday, we'll be arguing on appeal as to this issue of um, forced marriage. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Um, the issue of investigating and prosecuting sexual crimes of sexual violence is one that I think required a lot of thought at the beginning, at least of the ICTY. Uh, and there are people here who have worked in the field. Uh, Kelly Askin, who's one of the people here who also knows as much about this and worked in the area. Judge Wald knows of it from the case that she did. But the, the reality, I think, is that when you first start an investigation, uh, you don't start an investigation based on a theme. You don't generally start an investigation based on a particular thematic line. You start an investigation usually based on what the evidence presents before you that you're able to obtain. And that can lead you in either the right direction or the wrong direction. For sexual violence crimes, I think at times it could lead us in the wrong direction. Because the first crime that we often started investigating, that what we saw were murders. When you think now about the former Yugoslavia and understand the patriarchal society, you actually understand better that the men were targeted for murder and the women weren't. 
So by focusing on the murders as the most important crime, you actually don't recognize the different experiences in the community and in the crimes for women and men. By focusing then on the mass killings because of time, because of investigative resources, you hear stories from victims, and you may even hear stories from women victims who weren't murdered. And what's your first question to them? Can you tell me about what you know about the murders? Where does that lead you? In your investigation, it leads you in the direction of the murders and not in the direction of the sexual violence that was committed. So just to get back to the starting point of how do we get to the point where we need to be before we charge sexual violence, I think it starts for us now uh, a long time ago. It starts back in 93, 94. We had a, a, a legal advisor for gender issues, um, but I think we needed, uh, we needed more. We now see it much more in the context of the experience of those who suffer. In a, in a particular community that you're investigating, there are certain fundamental rights which, if violated, would constitute the crime of persecution. If you look at who you're investigating and you want to prove persecution through, for example, um, all, the, all members of ethnic group A, uh, first thing, they lost their job. Then they lost their positions of authority in the community. Then they were rounded up and put in detention centers, and then they were expelled. What type of community has most of the jobs which are women, most of the leadership positions which are women, and who are rounded up and put in detention because they're women? Well, quite frankly, not that many, because in patriarchal societies like in the former Yugoslavia, the persons who had the jobs, the persons in positions of authority, and the persons who could be the military opponent were men. What does that lead to? A non-investigation, or the possibility of a non-investigation into the other experiences uh, of women. So the question which related to how certain do we need to be before charging sexual violence, that's the final question. Um, and that standard is the same for, uh, I know this wasn't the purpose of the question, but that standard is the same for any other question for how much evidence do you need to charge a crime. You have to have a reasonable basis to believe that the person did it and meet the standard necessary for indicting them. What comes before that is how to obtain the evidence, how to understand the evidence, and how to fit that evidence into the context of the other crimes. One word of caution, though, is that it must be based on evidence, not on perceptions. There was material provided to us some time ago when we were amending the Karadich indictment uh, after his arrest uh, and uh, a large amount of uh, writing on a particular topic which related to gender violence and it didn't reflect the uh, evidence on the ground. When we approached victims and others, that wasn't what the, their stories were. Uh, their stories were similar but then had been extrapolated to create a larger story which wasn't reflected in what they said. Um, secondly, of course one has to consider whether to bring forward the victims and often take into consideration whether they're willing to come forward and I couldn't agree uh, more strongly uh, with Fatou uh, uh, on this point, which is that uh, to bring forward cases uh, of sexual violence which have not been properly investigated or have not got the proper collection of evidence uh, in a hurry to indict someone because of the larger pressures or the other crimes that you have is it's not only a disservice to uh, justice, a disservice to the accused, but it's clearly a disservice to the victims if there's not much chance that you're going to get it uh, to at least have a reasonable basis for conviction. You have to um, consider your legal case theory and you'll probably hear more of this so I won't uh, speak too much in this, but there was only, I think, someone mentioned earlier, there was only one crime, at least in our statute, that on its face addressed sexual violence, and it was the crime of rape as a crime against humanity. Well, rape, for those of you who are non-lawyers, it's obvious that rape is something different than a sexual assault or other forms of sexual violence, or in one of our cases, sexual enslavement, where there was a recognition that control over sexuality 
and in this case control over women's sexuality was a form of enslavement. So you have to look at your evidence and think of it in terms of the way that you can charge, the, the types of crimes that you have, persecutions, crimes, uh, outrages upon personal dignity, enslavement, things that are broader. We as lawyers tend to like to look at the law and think we're creative. Um, but in fact, you have to be really thoughtful to try and make the facts fit within a law without going outside of the confines of the law. Um, and lastly, in deciding, about, or at least in the steps taken for charging uh, crimes of sexual violence, much time and energy needs to be put into the investigation of the linkage to leaders. It, it's, at least in our more recent cases and in some of the convictions where crimes of sexual violence are not just isolated single acts done by soldiers on the ground. They are often used as tools and means of combat. Not legitimate combat, obviously, um, and you've heard it from my colleagues and you'll hear it from others, that it clearly is a means of combat. The uh, terrible, absolutely terrible events that we've heard about in Sierra Leone or, or Congo um, tell you that they are used. They're used as a means of terror, quite frankly, and should be charged as terror. But doing so, you have to think of how they get there. Who allows this to happen? Does someone order it? Is it explicitly or implicitly permitted by leaders? Do they use it as a tool themselves, or do they allow it happen and not uh, uh, stop their troops from doing because they see the benefit to it? And that's the last uh, comment I'll make, which is simply that before getting to the point of charging, you have to know what your linkage evidence is that raises it to the level of the most serious perpetrators if you're going to charge those perpetrators, those most serious and high-ranking uh, officials with crimes of sexual violence, which I think in many cases I think we have been able to prove and will be able to prove, and I think it's a step forward because it takes it out of the houses, the bedrooms, the, the camps in which these crimes take place, it brings it out into the light of the evidence and allows it to be presented as crimes perpetrated by leaders. Thank you. Thank you. At ICTR, we faced at the investigation level a lot of challenges. The first one is how to know that a given person, a given lady was victim of rape. So the issue is the identification of the victim and the potential witness. As I said this morning, Rwandans don't want to, don't like to talk much. And uh, sometimes it's only a neighbor who tells us this lady was raped. But our informant refuse to testify himself. So you have to find, to go to that lady to know if really she was a victim of that crime. Of course, that is another challenge because she, she will not accept immediately to speak. And once again, the problem of, of language, of communication, will arise because our investigators, as I said this morning, are not randoms, do not speak the local, the national language. We have to, to go to the victims with interpreters. But at that level also, there is another problem because the, the, the victims of rape are all Tutsis, and uh, our interpreters are Hutus. 
When a lady, a Tutsi lady, sees a Hutu interpreter, she will hesitate. She will not feel comfortable to speak. How to solve that problem? We, we, we have to, to do everything so that the, 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 the lady, the victim, speaks. And when she accepts to, to, to talk, to speak, she will never use the direct language. She will never say a man came and penetrated me, never. She will say, yeah, that man married me. You know, that is very kind. He, he married me. How could we understand a kind of language like that? But experience by experience, we come to be sure that what the witness was saying was true. So at the investigation level, really a lot of, a lot of challenges. And uh, in the legal uh, level now, another problem the crime of rape is not defined in the statute. The statute says only rape. What is rape? In national jurisdictions, in the civil law system, for example, there is rape when there is absence of consent. But how to prove in the context of Rwanda the absence of consent? There was a chaotic situation. So in the Akai case, for example, the chamber says the circumstances at that time were coercive. So a, a woman could not talk about accepting or refusing when a, a militiaman went to, to, to her. She, she, she had nothing to say. And she, 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 she got the rate. So what we do was that we, we, were, we agreed with the chamber in Akaisu case because at ICTY, for example, in a Konara case, they, they disagreed, the chamber disagreed with the Akaisu position where it was not necessary to look for, to find the, the, the absence of consent to determine whether or not there was rape. And uh, recently, in the Gatsumbichi case, the appeals chamber agreed somehow with the Akaisu trial chamber to say that if the prosecutor is able to prove that the rape, that the rape occurred in a particular 
situation, in particular circumstances, it's enough. It's enough. Now, how to be sure that the, the evidence we are bringing before judge, judges is credible? Because Rule 96 of the Rules of Evidence of Procedure and Evidence of ICTR says there is no need to col uh, corroborate the testimony, the evidence given by a victim. But sometimes the victims lie. They want to revenge because they are Tutsis. So how could, could we trust only one witness? to overcome this situation. We, we say that now, even those who were not victims of rape, including men, could testify. And in the Bagosura case, General Dallaire, who was commanding the UN forces in Rwanda, testify and say that he saw at a roadblock militiamen raping Tutsi women. And soldiers raping Tutsi women. And the, the chamber linked that fact to the accused because the accused should intervene to stop the rape. But he failed to do so. That he was held responsible for that crime. So that is what we are doing in the ICTR. Uh, we still have challenges, we still are facing problems, but we, <coughs> we are now glad because we have been able to, we have been able to, to, to lead the three chambers to take positions that are in favor of the prosecution. Of course, everything is not perfect, but we have been able to, to, to gain the conviction of about seven accused persons of rape uh, and other sexual violence and even torture has been considered, has been regarded as, as rape in the context of uh, Rwanda. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for those insightful comments. Um, there are so many questions that uh, are still uh, ready and uh, uh, that I, w I would like to ask and I want to give the audience an opportunity to ask questions too. So what I'll do uh, in the interest of time 
uh, is ask two questions uh, and then uh, allow you uh, to respond to either or both uh, in, the, in the time we have remaining. The first question is related to charging. Some of this uh, was already touched on uh, by some of you, uh, and, and I appreciate in particular uh, Norman Farrell's comment about asking the right questions on the front end before you even get to the charging decisions. Uh, but one of, these, one of the questions that, have, that has come up related to charging in all of these tribunals, and most recently in the case against one of the accused now before the ICC, charged with sexual violence crimes, uh, Jean-Pierre Bemba, is the question of which mode of responsibility most appropriately encompasses the accused's role in the crime. Uh, as we heard from uh, Fatou Ben Souda this morning, the prosecution initially charged uh, Jean-Pierre Bemba as individually criminally responsible for war crimes and crimes against humanity. Uh, however, the pretrial chamber decided that the evidence submitted by the prosecutor appeared to establish a different mode of responsibility, namely criminal liability as a commander or superior. Um, as Fatou mentioned in her remarks, uh, eventually the Office of the Prosecutor submitted an amended document containing superior responsibility as an alternative to individual criminal responsibility, and the pretrial chamber then uh, confirmed the indictment against Bempa, but again, only on the basis that he would be tried as a commander, um, pursuant to command responsibility and not individually. So the question relating to charging is how does, your off how does each of your offices make decisions about which mode of responsibility should be used to charge the accused, particularly in cases involving gender-based violence, and again, do different considerations arise for you in these kinds of cases than others where gender-based violence is not an issue. Um, there, in, the second question relates to um, challenges involved in proving uh, your case, uh, in proving gender-based crimes uh, once you have them in your indictment. Um, and the issue I want to raise is, again, somewhat unique to the ICC, but I would be curious as to the reactions of the prosecutors and the other tribunals as well. In the first case, the case against Lubanga, the prosecution requested permission to conduct uh, proofing of its witnesses prior to trial, which would involve allowing witnesses to read their statements and refresh their memories regarding the evidence they would give, putting questions to witnesses that the examining lawyer intends to ask at trial, and inquiring about possible additional information of both uh, potentially incriminatory and exculpatory nature. This kind of witness proofing has consistently been conducted by the prosecution and defense at, other, at the other tribunals, the ad hocs and the special court. But at the ICC, the pretrial chamber and the trial chamber overseeing the Lubanga case held that witness proofing cannot be conducted um, at the ICC, at least for lay witnesses, though they didn't have the same concern with respect to expert witnesses. So the question, maybe um, starting with uh, Fatou, is what impact the, the ICC's bar against witness proofing had on witnesses before the court, particularly on victims of sexual violence and uh, other, quote, vulnerable witnesses. Uh, what impact has this had on the ability of the prosecution to prove its case? And certainly for the other prosecutors, to what extent do prosecutors rely on witness proofing in preparing their, their case? Uh, so I'm going to, again, in the interest of time, there's a whole series of other questions I wanted to lay out, but let's um, perhaps uh, take on those two. And I know uh, Fatou wanted to add one comment to the last uh, series of comments, if you want to start. Um, okay, I know we're, we're running for um, time, but when um, Van was talking about the challenges that we face in uh, investigating crimes of, of gender and sexual violence, and said, and I think you, you quoted example about the interpreter who is uh, a Hutu and the male investigators going to meet with the victims. Um, I recall when I was in Rwanda because I had the privilege of working for the ICTR and to work with the investigators closely to advise them on, on what to do. And in one particular instance, we had to go and we were directed to a lady who was a, a victim of sexual violence, but who apparently has never spoken about this. We are talking about 10 years down the line, about 10 years. And this is a woman who was kept as a sex slave during the Rwanda genocide for at least three months and raped every day and night by at least seven men, you know, at a minimum. And she has never spoken about this. She, I think she just wanted it to, to go, go away. Eventually we got to her, um, and this time we decided to, to change tactics. I went with an interpreter who is a 
Tutsi, female Tutsi, and uh, the investigator was also um, a female. Even the driver was a female. And we went and we, we sat together and, and we talked. And she, for the first time in 10 years, spoke about what happened to her and her mother. Both of them were, I mean, sexually enslaved. And she cried so much that day. She cried her soul out. We all ended up in the room, all crying together. You know, this is just to show, I mean, what the victims, you know, go through, why they don't want to speak. But also, I, I wanted, I, I gave that example to show that it is not all the time that these women of sexual violence want to only speak to women. You know, sometimes, some of them do not want other women to know what they have gone through. And they would prefer to have a man. So I think it, uh, to a large extent, depends on the circumstances. Maybe, I mean, uh, the cultural as well as, you know, many other instances that you have. So most of the time you need to take it on a case-by-case -case basis and to see really what is best for the victim, for, for them not to, not to go through this. I just wanted to, to give that example. And coming to the issue of proofing, um, as Susanna has, has said, it's, it's um, in other ad hoc tribunals, other international tribunals, I mean, in most national jurisdictions, this is uh, what happens. You meet your witnesses, you go over the statement, you know, it is not to tell the witness what to say, but just to refresh and make sure that you leave the evidence before, before the court as they had given it to you. But in the ICC, this doesn't happen. This doesn't happen, and uh, it is only with expert witnesses that you can meet with. And in the Lubanga case, this is what the pretrial chamber had, the, the chamber had decided, the trial chamber had decided, and this is how we had to go through with presenting our evidence. Of course, it has presented challenges. And uh, maybe I'll just give you the example of the uh, first witness that we had who came to give evidence. I was leading that witness. And somewhere in the middle of the um, evidence, just after he started, he said, this was a child soldier, by the way, who was abducted when I think he was nine years old. Um, he, gave, he, he suddenly said that he wasn't abducted. You know, not, none of this thing happened. And, and that, you know, he sort of just wanted, wanted out. I mean, in normal criminal proceedings, this happens all the time. We, we have those incidences. But at that time, when he said this, of course, it was, uh, um, we were all taken aback, especially I was leading him. But I thought that it would, uh, it would not be wise to um, declare the, woman, the, 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 the child hostile, to impeach the child, and then to cross-examine him. Because normally, this is what you would do as a lawyer. You impeach, and then you you go on to the next step and cross-examine him and try to take it from him. Because I realized that perhaps all the protective measures that were supposed to be in place were probably not in place. And I was able to make the chamber to stop the proceedings, at least um, for that particular witness, to make investigations as to whether, whether there are any issues that we needed to know about him and why was he changing? Because he initially said, yes, I was abducted, I was going to school, and they stopped me, and they, you know, they arrested all of us, they took us in a van, and we went to the camp. It was there that he said, no, I was not abducted anymore. And when we, we made the, the investigations um, later on, uh, through the Victims and Witnesses Unit, the court ordered that that be done, he eventually came back to say that he was just angry. He, he just felt, you know, angry with everybody that, you know, this, he had to come here. And then he said everything was alien to him. You know, this courtroom, you know, he had to come to a place where he was coming from Ituri. At that time, maybe the temperature was about 96 degrees. He was brought to The Hague in the middle of winter. Yeah. And even the way he was dressed, you know, everything was strange. And I think um, with proofing, coming to proofing, if we had the opportunity of meeting with this child, okay, maybe that's one thing, but if we had the opportunity of meeting with the, with the child and asking, 
you know, what are your concerns, you know, see how we can adjust him to be able to uh, give evidence in these new circumstances. Probably that would have helped. I think that would have contributed. Also, I think we maybe underestimated the change that we have brought for this child not only from the prosecution side, victims and witnesses unit, registry, the court, everybody, I think. And this was a lesson that we had to learn, you know, from this incident. Eventually he came back, he gave evidence, very good evidence of everything that has happened, and finally told us that I was just angry. You know, I felt mad and I didn't want to say anything, so I just thought that if I said I wasn't abducted, they would let me go and I will go back to, 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 to where he was coming from. Um, but also with respect to proofing, we have had another um, incident where the witness came to the court and said that the statement that he gave to the prosecutor was wrong, that he was made by another person to give that statement and everything was fabricated. And you know, the, again, the court had to stop the, um, the evidence and then we made investigations. The prosecutor, we had to um, I mean, interview the witnesses again, the, that particular witness again in the presence of the defense, measures that the court had put in place. And I, I think that also if we were able to prove our witnesses before they come into the, the box, we would have been learning about all these uh, things that may surprise us in court. You know, then we will be able to go to the chamber and say, look, this is the situation with respect to this witness. Either we withdraw the witness or we, 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 we give up the witness for cross-examination without leading him or something. But we would at least be, be, be warned that um, something is coming up instead of learning about it when the witness is in the, in the box. And uh, it was completely separate from the uh, Victims and Witness Protection Unit of the registry. Uh, because we wanted to make sure that as we were getting we were getting ready to prove our case and making sure we have good packets on each of those witnesses, particularly women uh, who were uh, uh, victims of, of the sexual crimes, uh, the witness management unit's job was to um, visit each of these women, uh, develop relationships with them, uh, have separate teams that would work with them, uh, visit them on a regular basis throughout the year, uh, know where they were, had, we had GPS uh, uh, grid uh, locations for them, we had maps of where they're living because you just can't take out a, a, a map of Sierra Leone and go, well, she lives down the street on uh, 4th and Main. Uh, it's, you know, it's a four mile walk into this particular point and then you turn left at the stream and walk X number of miles and that's where she lives. We have to map all that out and get grid coordinates of all of these. But the witness management unit made up largely of members of the Sierra Leone National Police as part of our legacy program, which we were going to transfer it completely from there into back into the Sierra Leone National Police. Their mission was to care for the witnesses prior to uh, testifying, handing them off, but making sure that they're transported safely down to the court during the trial, and most importantly, and as importantly, post-trial. Uh, this is something that we need to work a lot more on, is taking these women who have been victims of such horrific crimes and to work with them after. Because again, all of them have to relive the crime in court in some form or another. And they are re-traumatized and have to be re-protected and reworked with. And so the witness management unit's job was to, to do this, and we were also training up our Sierra Leonean uh, colleagues to do that under the guise of uh, some very sh sharp Royal Canadian Mounted Police victim and witness protection professionals. Uh, and that program, I believe, continues, doesn't it, Joseph? Or is it getting ready to be transferred? Uh, but I think this is a way, it's not the way, but a way of making sure your, your victims of sexual crimes are cared for, even though it was all of our witnesses, but was particularly paid real close attention to the care uh, of those children or women who were, were victims. Just to add to that, I am um, one of the strongest supporters for having women prosecutors at all levels, and it comes with experience. 
And that is um, men feel and respond differently to crimes of rape or gender violence related offenses. And that is the truth. And um, even as prosecutors, there is always that danger. Given the opportunity, they'll always find an excuse. It comes with strength of cart and purpose for men to be as engaging in the prosecution of these offenses. And I'm speaking from experience. I'm a victim myself. When I started practicing in 1990, I prosecuted, I worked for the law officer's department, the attorney general's office in Sierra I prosecuted rape and other gender-related offenses. They were just like any other offense, fraudulent conversion, last scene, and all, with no sentimentality, until one day I had a case of armed robbery that accompanied rape. And uh, it was an elderly lady, 70 years old, and the accused was a teen. So in the course of the armed robbery, he decided to change his mind and rape this elderly lady. And while I was leading her in court, and at the common law level, that is, we don't do proofing, and I was leading her in court, one thing she said, that she blotted out, which she never mentioned, it was not in the statement, was that when he decided to rape me, I pleaded with him, kill me instead. I was shocked. He said, kill me instead, do not touch me. At the end of the trial, we secured a conviction that I went home. But that statement re-echoed in my head. What, she preferred to die? But then, it was an awakening. It was a shock awakening for me to realize the importance of that offense of rape. I've been referring to that as a, a conversion of Joseph, like Saul converted on the road to Damascus. <laughs> Honestly, that is the time I realized that for certain people, particularly women, rape is more important than murder. And let me bring you back now to our own scenario at the special court where I'm saying this. In that case of the CDF, I did mention it this morning where we were prevented of amending the indictment to introduce the rape charges. And uh, the judges forbidden us from proceeding with evidence of gender violence. And how are we to do that? If you are to proceed and lead evidence on physical violence, let me give you an example. This lady was testifying about physical violence. She was beating, and then the commander, one of the accused, came to the scene. And then he said, leave her alone. Indeed, they left her. He grabbed her and took her inside the room. And the moment she said, he took me into the room, the judge said, stop there. That is forbidden territory. He said, my Lord, how can we stop? We all know what happened inside the room. And we have ruled against that in this court. Yes, it happened. So some of these examples that I'm giving is not like um, they are theoretical, but these are factual incidents, and I think that is where we have to learn and share experiences about these issues. Some may be hard facts to accept, but we are forbidden from proceeding with evidence that touches and concerns gender violence because we have been prohibited from doing that by way of an amendment. But then another question I came out of that courtroom was, there are three judges, they're all men. And on appeal, because we, we filed an interlocutory appeal, that is before the end of the case, we still go to the appellate chambers. We filed an interlocutory appeal. The appeals chamber, all the men agreed with the defense. The woman agreed with the prosecution. So I've always been asking myself, is it because she's a woman? But now, when back I look at the successes of the special court, we have women heading almost all the sections. Is it that we are successful? Is that why we are successful? Except for the prosecutor. The chief of legal operations is a woman. The chief of administration is a woman. The acting registrar is a woman. The chief of personnel is a woman. <laughs> but these are the kind of things. But then the question always is, let us not mislead ourselves. Men think differently from women, be they prosecutors or not, when it comes to these issues. 
and it comes with deep training. And I'm happy to state it today that it is a highly essential for women to participate in these processes because they feel far different from how we feel as men when it comes to this type of offenses. And even in the course of our dialogues and everything, Professor Crane will tell you more about it. It was not easy. But we all came on board. We got the feeling. We got the passion. And when you hear the evidence at that level from the conflict, you will have no choice but to take up the fight to the highest level. Thank you. Thank you so much for your comments. Um, We're, we're running uh, five minutes behind, but I do want to give you uh, both uh, an opportunity, just uh, a couple of comments if you'd like uh, on the questions I raised. And then I don't know uh, if you want to uh, give me an extra five minutes for a question from the audience or not, but I'll leave it up to you uh, either way. No, okay. So uh, a couple of concluding remarks from uh, Norman and Alphonse, um, and then I'm so sorry, we're going to have to close the session for lack of time. Please. Just in concluding on, uh, um, I agree with all my colleagues, uh, maybe not so much with the last one. Um, <laughs> I tend to hope I can think similar to everyone else. Oh, I'm only kidding, Joseph. I think it was, no, no, I think it was a very valuable contribution. Yeah. Um, just uh, two points then. Uh, one of the questions that was asked was uh, related to a concept called proofing. For those of you who are not involved in this field, proofing is when you speak to the witness just before their testimony. So you sit down and you explain uh, to them what's going to happen and you discuss their testimony. And some of the tribunals uh, were allowed to do that. In the ICC, they're not allowed to do that. The general feeling is that you somehow influence the witness. And if you speak to the witness the night before or the morning before they go in to testify, the fear is that you somehow influence their testimony. If you simply take a statement months and months before and they come in and tell what's in their statement, there's no chance for their evidence to be in any way interfered with. That's what the underlying question is about proofing. Uh, I am, uh, I didn't do proofing in my home jurisdiction very much. Uh, when it comes to sexual, crimes of sexual violence, I am a strong proponent of proofing. Uh, I think that it's very important that the persons that come in understand the process, they understand what you're going to ask them, and they understand who's going to ask them those questions. In many of the examples given by my colleagues, uh, the questions about who they'll speak to, who victims of sexual violence will speak to, has been raised. And in my experience, and the experience of the lawyers who are uh, much more versed than I am, uh, there often is some type of trust that is developed between the victim who tells their story to the first time or to the first time to a foreigner and the person to whom that story is told. Uh, and in situations where there's stereotypes, lack of trust, community bias, societal bias, and the fear to tell anyone because it might get back to their family, for them not to have the opportunity to at least see the person they're gonna get questioned by, to have some type of relationship, for that person just to explain to them what's gonna happen the next day, I think it creates an unnecessary burden on the victims of sexual violence. Uh, and if the lawyers do their job properly, they shouldn't be influencing them anyway. Um, in relation to your question about charging modes of responsibility, um, the issue relates to, once again, for those who are unaware, the issues relates to people who are not directly involved in sexual violence crimes and are removed from it. In other words, the people that are higher up, the commanders or the political superiors. And if that's the case, the question related to how do we capture their criminal conduct and how, do we, how are we able to say that they are guilty if they're so far removed? Crimes are committed in a town uh, in Bosnia uh, and we've charged certain uh, senior leaders for the crimes of sexual violence that were a three hour drive away where the commander was in a completely different zone of responsibility at the time. So that question is uh, take a lot longer to um, to answer, uh, but I think it relates to whether or not there's sufficient evidence to directly link the crimes on the ground, obviously, to the uh, to the commander or perpetrator. Anyway, because of time, thank you. Last word, if you'd like. Uh, <coughs> very, very briefly. What, 
we have as, as uh, uh, problems is that sometimes we call the witness very, very long time after a st statement to the investigators. So when times come to testify, she had forgotten great details of her statement. Mm -hmm. So we have to prepare the witness. And sometimes when she tries to, to remember a, a statement, she, she adds more detail that are not in the, the statement. And yet the statement has been disclosed already to the defense. So we cannot tell her to give that new detail in, in court it will be a problem. So we try just to, to help her to, to remember. And we, 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 we read some passages of the, the statement to, to her and she confirms. Or sometimes she says, no, 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 that's not true. But you stated five years ago. How today you can say you didn't say that? It's a very, very big problem. So the, the lesson we learn from that is that despite the provision of Rule 96, we try to corroborate this statement by other, by fresh or additional witnesses. Like that, we, we have some, some chance to, to convince the, the judges. I remember now a, a specific example uh, regarding the, the, the difficulties in the last case I conducted. One of the, the witnesses alleged that she had been raped and as a result infected with uh, eight virus, and we 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 we, we met a medical doctor, and it was confirmed that she had that virus. We produced the, 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 the medical certificate, a medical certificate, in court, but the defense say, no. There is no link between. A alleged rape and our client. So, and she was she was really confident. She, she said, "No, those, those these soldiers raped me, and they gave me the HIV virus. I did not have that before. How today we can say?" There is no link between the, the, the soldiers and my situation. And because the, the accused himself did not rape, he is subordinate, his soldiers did rape. So we try to, to link this accused to what his subordinate did against that lady. Okay, we are waiting for a judgment, but we are not sure that the, the chamber will follow us in this regard. Thank you. Thank you again. Please join me in thanking uh, the panel for insights. Thank you again.